Okay, Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Omar Ahmed. I'm a fourth year medical student, and today I'll be giving you a pharmacology review question, uh, session. We'll be having many questions, inshallah. So let's uh, dive right into it. So we're going to be covering uh, four lectures, the four you've taken, okay, opioids, medications for migraines, anesthetics, and sedative hypnotics. So I think the usual way uh, you guys do it is that you read the question, and then you put the answer, and then we'll discuss it. So I'll do the same thing. You can read it yourself, and then we'll discuss two other after I see answers in the chat. But before, so this is the first question. We'll start off with opioids. But before you read the question, I wanted to give you some few uh, advice and like tips on how to approach questions in general. You'll be using these tips for the rest of like all the exams you take in medical school or even even after. Okay. So the first thing I do. So I've been using these tips since second year. Okay. The first thing I do, especially if I see questions that are very long, like five, six lines long, okay? I'm gonna read the last line. The last line or the last sentence, okay? So like, why? Because I wanna know what the question is talking about. So the last line and then just skim over the question, the answers, okay? So I wanna know what the question is asking, what's the question talking about, okay? For example, if you go into your neuro midterm, you wanna know if there's a question about physiology, pathology, anatomy, pharmacology, what is it about, okay? You just so you can narrow down when you're reading what you should focus on, when you're reading the rest of the question, what you should focus on, okay? The second thing is that when you see the question and what they're asking for, you can narrow down even more what you wanna look for in the question. For example, in pharmacology, if you if they're just asking for a method of action, then you really of a, of a drug, then you really, you really don't need to know what the scenario is about. You just need to know what drug they gave, and that's method and its method of action. So you could save time from reading the rest of the question, not just time, but the mental energy. Imagine you're reading a question; it's a very hard scenario, a very hard case. You're not understanding it. In the end, you don't even need to understand the case. You just need to know the drug they gave, for example. Okay, so we'll see how that tips how those tips work throughout. So let's start off. You can read the first question right now. When I start seeing answers in the chat, then we'll discuss it, inshallah. Go ahead. So anyone know the answer? Okay, okay, so let's start. Okay, we'll start off, uh, let's read the question. Okay, so let's do the thing I was telling you to do. Let's read the last line, okay? It says, started on oral morphine therapy, which of the following is the most likely direct of this medication? Okay, so they're asking, they gave you morphine and they're asking for the method of action. Do you really need to know the, the rest of the case? Of course, I'll still advise you to go back and read the case. Okay, in all scenarios, still go back and read the case. But now you can really narrow it down. So let's go with the case. A woman with breast cancer, pain, okay? Not getting treated with NSAIDs uh, and acetaminophen. She was given morphine. Now what's the method of action of morphine? That's the question, okay? So let's talk about the method of action of morphine. Someone said D, increase chloride influx into the cells, okay? Which, which is a good option, okay? It's not the correct option, but it's a good option. Allow me to explain to you like how these like CNS drugs work, where they're at, whether it's anti-seizure or it's sedatives or opioids, they all have the same product in the end. They want to decrease the membrane potential of the cell, okay? E, okay, people are saying E, that's the correct answer, okay? So now I'm saying, so you want to decrease the membrane potential. You know how it's negative, okay, and it's positive. Polarization, you you know all that basic physiology, right? You want to make it negative, so you can have hyperpolarization, so you don't have activation of these cells. And if you don't have activation of the cells, you're not gonna have pain, you're not gonna have seizures, et cetera, okay? So there's two ways you can make it negative. One is if you kick out the positive ion, ion, uh, uh, ions out, right? So what are positive ions? Potassium, for example. If you kick that out, it's gonna become more negative. So that's one good way. Another way, is, is not letting it in, okay? So you can block sodium going in. That's still gonna make it more negative. That's also decreases the potential in the end. And then the, and the second way we're talking about is putting more 
negative ions into the cell. And how can you do that? What's the negative ion we all know of? Chloride, okay? Chloride is negative, so you want to bring that more in, okay? So let's go, so those are the two ways we can think of, okay? So now let's look at, look at the options. A, activation of sodium calcium exchange, wrong. B, blockade of voltage dependent sodium influx. Can that lower pain, can that, is that something that, that will decrease the negative potential? That, that will make it more negative? Yes. But is that the actual method of action of morphine? No. That's actually for seizures, which we'll take after the midterm. C, increased calcium influx. If you make it more negative, it's going to depolarize and you're going to have more pain. So that's completely wrong. Even if you don't know a specific uh, action of morphine, you should just know that's not going to be good for pain. Okay. D, increased chloride influx. Yes, it, it will make it negative, And that is a good option, but that's actually not morphine. That's actually the method of action of two other drugs, which you've taken, uh, drug classes. And do you guys know them? So barbiturates and benzodiazepines, okay, which we'll be discussing in the sedative hypnotics. So we were left with E, increased potassium efflux, and that is the correct answer. Morphine, its method of action is increasing potassium efflux, kicking the potassium outside of the cell, making it more negative. Okay, so this is the slide from uh, Dr. Dilip, Dr. Sorry, uh, Santos' uh, lecture, okay? So here's the presynaptic, postsynaptic. Please, this came in our midterm. Please know this well, okay? That in the presynaptic, you have less calcium influx, and in the postsynaptics, you have uh, potassium uh, efflux, okay? You have to know that. You have to know that in presynaptic, it's calcium, postsynaptic, it's potassium. And the second thing you have to know from this slide is that kappa, if you, you can see my mouse, right? So kappa receptors, they only affect the presynaptic terminal, okay? While mu receptors are both in the presynaptic and postsynaptic uh, 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 neurons. So just make sure you know that. Two things I mentioned here, okay? Let's move on to the next question. So you can read it and then I'll see answers in the chat. E. Uh, everyone's saying E, which is the correct answer. Let's go into it. Okay, let's go into the question. Five-year-old boy, drug ingestion, mother found him unresponsive. One of the, look, you have to focus on unresponsive. It's one of the symptoms of uh, signs uh, of uh, opioid uh, overdose. Okay, so you have to keep that in the mind, in your mind. Uh, empty bottle of hydrocodone. So they, they said it right there. It's either opioid or acetaminophen intoxication. One of them, okay. Uh, the patient was found stuporous and bradypnea. Okay, stuporous, it means it's almost like in a coma, similar to a coma. So you're you're just decreased, you're low down, okay? And so that's also another symptom of, uh, sorry, sign of uh, opioid uh, overdose. And then bradypnea is very important. Do you guys know what that means? It means low uh, respiratory rate, which is very important, okay? It's one of the like cardinal signs of opioid overdose, having low respiratory depression, but they won't always tell you it in this way, that the patient has bradypnea. They might tell you uh, a low respiratory rate, like seven or eight, because the normal respiratory rate is 12 to 20. So it will be decreased, okay? His men, uh, okay, so he was taken to the hospital and his status improved after naloxone was administered. What is naloxone? It's an antagonist of, uh, of the uh, opioid receptor and it's, it's the treatment for opioid overdose, okay? Uh, and the patient got better, but then what happened is that one hour later, he was he has worsening lethargy, bradypnea, and meiosis. So, so basically he's getting the same symptoms of overdose again. And meiosis is also very important for uh, um, opioid overdose, okay? So remember these uh, symptoms, okay? Stup uh, like respiratory depression, okay? Almost in a coma, unconscious, they might tell you, okay? And then meiosis, I, I, if, I don't know if you guys know the difference between meiosis. I'm sure you do the meiosis and midriasis. If it's confusing for some of you, remember, okay? So meiosis, it's a smaller word than midriasis. Midriasis is a bigger word, and that's why midriasis 
has a bigger pupil, okay? Because a bigger word, bigger pupil, and meiosis, smaller words, smaller pupil, okay? So that's the way you can remember it. Besides meiosis, they might tell you uh, pinpoint pupil, which means small pupil, or the pupil is constricted, okay? They might tell you any of these terms. They're not just going to tell you meiosis. That's the easiest way. So which of the following most likely accounts? And you guys said E, which is the right answer. Naloxone, okay? If we can see here. Uh, okay, look, if you read the last line, this is from the doctor's lecture. Its effect is rapid and it is short acting. Okay, we, we got this in, a, in our in midterm two, exact same, almost similar question. Uh, why did they get the symptoms again? Because it's short acting. Okay, like we said, it's a treatment for poisoning with um, opioid overdose. Also remember this third point that for buprenorphine, you need higher doses. Why? Because buprenorphine, it takes over more receptors. It's gonna cover more receptors so the naloxone that comes is going to need to remove buprenorphine from more receptors. So you're going to need a higher level of naloxone. Okay, remember that. Buprenorphine was one of the drugs, which you need a higher level of naloxone to remove. Okay. And okay, now let's go on to the third question. Okay, someone's saying C, okay. Okay, let's start off with the question, okay. Uh, a 36 year old man is admitted to the hospital for treatment of burn wounds on his upper extremities. An analgesic therapy with an opioid drug is given. He was given an opioid. Shortly after, the patient develops diarrhea, abdominal pain, and his pupils have become enlarged. On further questioning, the patient reports that he has been smoking opium at home to help him deal with the depression and pain. So, which, which of the following drugs was given? What's happening here? And that's the first question, okay? Someone said D, okay, you changed the answer. Uh, withdrawal, okay, exactly. That's exactly the answer, okay? So he was given opioids. How is he getting withdrawal symptoms? You'd expect the opposite. You'd expect him to be getting overdose symptoms, right? But diarrhea, abdominal pain, pupils, those are the complete opposite of overdose symptoms. Those are withdrawal symptoms. Instead of getting constipation from opioids, you get diarrhea. Instead of removing pain, decreasing pain, you're gonna get more pain. And then instead of meiosis, you get midriasis, which is here, pupils become enlarged. So how is he getting withdrawal symptoms? He says he's already on opium, okay? He's already taking opium. It means his opium to opioid tolerance is probably already high. He's probably on something strong and he needs a lot of opioids, okay? But he was given a drug that was much weaker. It was weak to the point it gave him withdrawal symptoms. Now, what can that drug be? Okay, there are two drugs. So like you said, pentazosine is one of them. Why? Because pentazosine is a partial agonist and partial antagonist. So the, opio the opium that was already in his body from him smoking it got antagonized. So it's not ha it doesn't have an effect anymore. And now it just has a partial effect. So what happened? So he's going to get withdrawal symptoms as if he stopped taking opioid, okay? Another drug that can do that also is buprenorphine, okay? Also remember that because buprenorphine is, is a, it's a partial agonist, okay? So if I replace D with buprenorphine, that would also be a correct answer. These two questions, these two are, uh, choices are correct, okay? So this is a, this is from uh, the slides, pentazosine, okay? Mixed agonist, please remember that it's cap receptor, it's an agonist, okay? And it blocks mu receptor, which is like more, most other drugs in the opioid class effect, and it causes withdrawal symptoms. Doctor also wants you to know like it causes dys dysphoria, Remember that happens with kappa. It does not happen with new receptors. Dysphoria happens with kappa receptors and at high doses increase blood pressure and heart rate. Remember that too. So if a patient is given a drug and he gets dysphoria, uh, an opioid and he gets dysphoria and high blood pressure and heart rate, you're thinking of pentazosine, which acts as an agonist to where? At the kappa receptor, okay? So uh, yeah, 
Um, and like we said, withdrawal symptoms, complete opposite. The we Listen, by the end of the neuro block, you're going to have to know many drugs and their withdrawal symptoms, cocaine, marijuana, uh, opioids, okay, alcohol, etc. Opioids is the easiest to know. Like it's really like a viral illness, like rhinorrhea, sneezing, like which drug are you going to get that from? It's, it's obviously going to be opioid, yawning, okay? Like I said, nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, midriasis, okay? So this is very typical of opioid with, uh, withdrawal. Uh, yeah. And let's move on. So this is, that's the last question for opioids, okay? Because uh, I don't want to take too much time. We have other uh, topics to cover too. But here are just some other points I wanted to mention in opioids, okay? Remember that opioids can be used in pulmonary edema. No, but not other pulmonary issues. You have to remember the contraindications. Pulmonary problems are of contraindication, except for pulmonary edema. That's an indication. We got that in our midterm, okay? Tolerance is not developed to constipation and meiosis. Tolerance, what does that mean? It means you need more, more a higher level of a certain drug to get the same effect. So you need more uh, opioid to get pain relief, okay, for example. But the constipation meiosis stays there. Even after it's a long time on the same drug, it does not go away, okay? So these are two that you have to remember that they still stay there after a while, okay? Also came in the past paper and also came in board's exam. Uh, withdrawal symptoms are treated with methadone or buprenorphine. Don't, don't forget that, okay? Uh, so if, if you have a drug addict that wants to stop taking drugs or he has withdrawal symptoms, then you can give him uh, methadone, okay? Uh, also came. So that's it for opioids. Just remember the biggest things is the types of opioids, which one's a partial agonist, antagonist, uh, full agonist. The difference between mu and cap receptors, uh, the effects of overdose and also withdrawal, the difference between them, and then the treatments for both and also pentazosine, okay? And also contraindications are pretty important too. Just try to look at this. The contraindications are all related to the method of action of morphine, okay? They all have something in common. It's not just some random contraindications you can understand. There's a reason for those contraindications, okay? So now we'll talk about anesthetics, but before I do, does anyone have any questions about opioids? Please feel free to question. You can message me directly if you don't want to put in, uh, I think you can choose to message directly in Zoom, I don't know. Okay, anyone have any questions? I'll give it 10 seconds. Okay, we don't have any questions. Thank you, Ahmed, for replying. Okay, let's go on. So now anesthetics. We have local and general anesthesia. Let's go. This is the first question. Please do read it. And if you use my tip, it's going to be very easy. Okay, so let's discuss the question. Okay, so let's say I'm approaching this question. I'm gonna read the last sentence. Uh, which of the following characteristics is the most likely reason for use of this anesthetic agent? It means they use an anesthetic agent. Let's find out what the anesthetic agent was. We'll read the sentence before it. Prior to endotracheal intubation, ketamine was administered for induction of anesthesia. So they're asking why ketamine was administered. Okay, so that's basically the, the idea of the question. Now let's read the rest of the question. 46 year old man, Shortness of breath, cough, fever, patient experienced mild upper respiratory uh, illness a week ago. He has asthma, uses inhaled bron bronchodilators more frequently. The past two days, worsening breathlessness, okay, productive cough, high fever, uh, no other medical conditions, vitals, fever, hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, okay. Physical examination, the, period, the patient appears in severe disparity distress. 
with intercostal interactions. Uh, long auscultation reveals bilateral wheezing, which is um, uh, a sign of uh, asthma. I don't know if you learned that yet, but that's a sign of asthma, basically. Okay. Uh, prompt endotracheal. Okay, so ketamine. So they get ketamine. Now, why did they get ketamine? Anyone know the answer? This is probably a hard question. No one, get, no one gave the answer. So let's start. Uh, someone give the answer. E, you're, you're right. Yes. Two, uh, yeah, you're right. Okay. The answer is E, sympathomimetic activity. Let's start. Direct GABA agonism. That's wrong because ketamine does not act to GABA. It acts as an NMDA receptor antagonist. Okay. It lowers lipid solubility. That's not true. It has a high lipid solubility. Metabolism by plasma enzymes. Okay. It's also not true. Plasma enzymes, the only thing that gets metabolized by plasma enzymes is succinylcholine, which is a neuromuscular blockade uh, drug. Okay. Neuromuscular blockade effect, that's also wrong. It does not act at the acetylcholine receptor. I just said it acts at the NMDA receptor. Okay. Just knowing that, you can cross out A and D. We're left with E. So, just generally, even if you don't know the answer, E, if, but if you cross out everything else, you can know that it's E. Now, why is sympathomimetic activity important here? Okay, this was in the lecture. Ketamine is good for asthma patients. This patient has asthma. Why is it good for asthma patients? Because it has a sympathomimetic activity. If you remember, B2 receptors cover the lungs, the, the, the smooth muscle. And if you activate B2 through sympathomimetic activity, it's going to lead to bronchodilation, which is good for um, asthma, asthma patients. Okay. Uh, so this is the this is the slides, okay? Like I said, NMDA receptor, anti-NMDA receptor. Please remember that it's not just an anesthetic, it's an also an analgesic, so it's also good for pain relief, okay? So you get two in one. And the patient is a dissociated state, okay? So they may appear awake, awake. I mean, usually from what I know is that they're not really unconscious, they can still be awake. So if you want the patient to be awake, okay, you can give ketamine, okay? And then remember that Sympath uh, sympathomimetic, so it increases blood pressure, cardiac output, and also bronchodilation. So it's good for asthmatics. Okay, here you have three past paper, uh, past uh, questions. Okay, you have uh, one it being an analgesic, one it be not giving complete con uh, unconsciousness, and then as being good for asthmatics. Okay, so that's that's ketamine, which is a general anesthetic. Uh, and then, so like I said, ketamine has its own specific properties that are pretty unique to it. So you have to know the other unique properties of the other uh, anesthetics, the IV anesthetics used for induction, like propofol, okay? It has anti-emetic properties. What does that mean? It means it, it, you don't get post-operative nausea and vomiting when you are, when it, usually when you get propofol. So if a patient doesn't want post-operative nausea and vomiting, or you want to decrease the risk of that, what do you give? Propofol. Second, ketamine, we just talked about that. Etomidate, which is the third one, not really used, but it's used for cardiovascular dysfunction, okay? If they have cardiovascular problems or if they are, have, uh, uh, so I don't think you learn, you've learned this yet, but like hemodynamically unstable, which, which means, let's say if they have hypotension, okay, it's also good. Uh, but yeah, basically just know that it's good for the cardiovascular because it doesn't cause hypertension, okay? That's why. But a side effect is that low aldosterone levels. And that's really like, imagine they just give you a question saying a patient was given anesthetics and he has a low aldosterone level. That's really easy just to know that it's atomidate, okay? So remember these three uh, unique properties of these T drugs. Now, uh, let's go on to the next question. So uh, this is the next question. Yes, okay, so the, everyone's saying C, and the answer is C, you're correct. So let's look at the last line. Okay, it says, which of the following is the most likely impact of mixing the latter medication with the anesthetic agent? What's latter medication? They're talking about epinephrine here. Okay, local anesthesia is administered via an infiltrating injection of lidocaine mixed with epinephrine. Why is epinephrine given with local anesthetics? The answer is C, okay? 
prolonged duration of action of anesthetic agent. Uh, by the way, what's B? So B is something else that is like, it doesn't make sense, but is, uh, it's, a, it's a concept you should understand. Decreasing pH, okay, it increases anesthesia potency. That's wrong, it's actually the opposite, okay? A decrease in pH will decrease an uh, anesthesia potency. Okay, remember that, it's in your lecture. So, so here's a uh, slide explaining uh, why it's C, like we said, okay? So local anesthetics themselves cause vasodilation. And if you cause vasodilation, the anesthetic is just gonna go everywhere, but you don't want that to happen. If you're getting a tooth surgery, you just want it to stay there in, the tooth, in your teeth, right? So uh, epinephrine causes vasoconstriction, okay? It decreases systemic absorption, uh, so decreases systemic side effects, that's one thing. Another thing is that increases the potency of uh, the local anesthesia there, okay? And also decreases local bleeding. So remember that for anesthetics, for the local anesthesia. Okay, uh, and now this is uh, a slide I put in because I was looking at the slides, local anesthetics. It wasn't part of our question, but I just want I just want to let you know that this came in our exam uh, two years ago. I'm fourth year, so in second year, many people got it wrong because we all overlooked this. We're like, oh, it's not going to come, but unfortunately, it did come. The question is was like uh, a patient wanted a long a doctor wanted to use a drug that was long acting for a certain surgery. So which one it was? One of these was it? I don't know if tetracaine came because that's also long, but bupivacaine, I think it was, I remember that was being the answer because it has a long duration of action, okay? So maybe you can remember that it has a long duration of action and lignocaine has a fast onset, okay? So if they ask you onset, lignocaine, duration, bupivacaine. We get it? Okay, now let's move on to the next question. So uh, yeah, you can read this. Okay, so someone says C, I'll wait for another answer. Someone says uh, E, okay, people are saying E. Yeah, so E is the answer, let's go through it, okay? Which of the following mechanisms most likely explains this patient's rapid recovery from anesthesia? So, and he was given propofol, okay? He was given propofol, so they're asking that why did he recover so fast from propofol? So you have to know the pharmacokinetics, dynamics, whichever one it is, for propofol, okay? And what that is, is that propofol has rapid onset of action and rapid, yeah, exactly. So it goes in the, it goes rapidly to other uh, deposits in other organ systems like the fat, muscles, okay, rapidly goes into them because it's highly lipid soluble. Lipid soluble fat, lipid fat, so it's gonna go there, okay? Uh, that's why it's the answer is E, tissue redistribution of the drug, okay? It's not C, look, okay, uh, propofol is also eliminated by the liver, okay? But here E is the first that's more important. Why? Because here, look, plasma levels decline rapidly. This is from the lecture. This is a result of redistribution, redistribution first, followed by a prolonged period of happening. So first redistribution happens, and then later on, hepatic metabolism happens. And it says here, hepatic metabolism and renal clearance. But just to be on the safe side, if you get that in the question, in a question, and you have to choose between hepatic and renal, choose hepatic, okay? Because it's lipid soluble. Usually, the more water soluble goes to renal clearance. Propofol is, I, I'm pretty sure it's uh, metabolized hepatically, okay? So yeah, that's propofol, okay? Uh, remember one, it's it redistributes rapidly. And the other thing, good for post-operative decreasing nausea and vomiting, okay? So that's it for anesthetics. I have some other questions in the end in case you have more time, but I just wanted to cover all uh, the, I wanna cover all topics uh, and then come back, revisit all the topics that you could have weakness in, for example. So does anyone have any questions for anesthetics? I probably didn't mention too much, malignant hyperthermia, remember that too. It's, uh, it's from inhaled uh, uh, general anesthesia, okay, and also succinylcholine. Okay, uh, remember that malignant hyperthermia, you have hypertension, tachycardia, high fever. So if, uh, and if a patient has that from before, you can give propofol for induction because propofol doesn't induce that. And if you want neuromuscular blocking effect, 
So you need other drugs. Just don't give succinyl and choline. Rucuronium, vacuronium, those are also, those are uh, muscular blocking uh, effects that don't cause malignant hyperthermia, okay? Yeah, uh, the mean alveolar concentration, yeah, just remember that don't, I don't think you need to know the specific number if there are numbers, for example, but you need to know its relation to potency. They have a reciprocal re relation. So the higher uh, your potency, the lower your uh, MAC is gonna be, okay? Or let's say, let me say in the opposite way. The higher the MAC, the lower, the, 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 the better, the, the lower the potency, okay? So it just goes in opposite ways. So if you want a high potent drug, if you want a high potent drug, it has to have a low MAC, okay? So low MAC, high potency. High potency, what does that mean? It means you give less of the drug, okay? I hope that answers your question and doesn't confuse you. Just remember it just in the opposite way. MAC and, uh, yeah. Okay, so let's start off, let's start with the sedative hypnotics. Okay, okay, I'm glad it does. Okay, okay. so sedative hypnotics, you can read the, you can read the question. Okay, let's, uh, let's answer the question, discuss it. So let's read the last line. It says, expected beneficial effect of this drug is most likely caused by which of the following mechanisms? And then it's mentioning GABA. So you know it's gonna have something to do with uh, barbiturates or benzodiazepines, the question, okay? And then you just find out what the drug is, which is lorazepam, okay? You can read the rest, but for time's sake, I'll just answer lorazepam, uh, beneficial effect. So it's basically asking, what is the method of action of lorazepam? And do you know what lorazepam is? It's a benzodiazepine. What does benzodiazepine do? Okay. Uh, remember, benzodiazepines and barbiturates affect GABA receptors. Okay. The way they do it is through uh, leading through. Okay. So benzodiazepines. A. Okay. A is actually wrong. So I'll explain to you right now. So benzodiazepines. You can remember it that it increases the frequency, which means the number of times the GABA receptor is opened. Okay, frequency means the number of times the GABA receptor is opened. So let's say if in a minute a certain GABA receptor opens five times, instead of five times opening in that one minute, it's going to make it ten times opening in that one minute. Okay, so you can remember that by frenzodiazepines. They say that's like a, a funny way to remember instead of benzodiazepines, frenzodiazepine frequency. B, B is the right answer, yes, okay. Uh, so, let's, so, so let's say B. So I just said it uh, increases the activation, okay? So here we're left with either B or C. These are the only ones that make sense. E is not an MDA. C, increased duration of chloride channel opening. Okay, duration is time, and we said a frequency, right? So allosteric activation. I think the word allosteric is what... Um, uh, confused you. Allosteric just means that it binds to a different site, okay? So it binds to a different site and it leads to activation of GABA-A receptors, which is the, the method of action of benzodiazepines. C, increased duration, that's not for benzodiazepines, that's for barbiturates, okay? Uh, so, and instead of barbiturate, you can remember it as barbit duration, okay? Barbiturates, barbituration. So that's another way of remembering that barbiturates help increase how long the channel is open. So how long the channel is open, barbiturates. Please remember this. This comes like 
I'm sure it's going to come in your, whether it's your midterm or final, you're definitely going to see it when you're practicing later on, whether it's for SMLE boards, any boards, okay? You have to know the difference between uh, benzodiazepines and barbiturates in their method of action. So like we said, it's B, okay? Uh, yeah, there, there it is. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so let's go with this question. Yeah, so someone says D, uh, and that is the right answer. So let's read this question. Short-term treatment with which of the following drugs is the most appropriate pharmacotherapy? So they're going to give you a drug, okay, and they want to know what, uh, which one to use as treatment. So that's the question, what they're asking. So now let's look at what, they, what the patient has. 27-year-old woman comes to the physician because of poor sleep, sleeping less, difficulty initiating sleep, okay? So initiating sleep. Doesn't have trouble, trouble maintaining. Uh, she feels tired throughout the day. She has a uh, sleep. Uh, she does. She wants sleeping aid, but doesn't want to feel drowsy. Okay, in the morning, she does not want to feel drowsy. So you want to give her something short acting. If you give her something long acting, and that also has active metabolites, it's gonna stay even after she wakes up. It's still still gonna have an effect, and she's gonna be tired, right? So out of these, the shortest acting is triazolam. So C is also used for sleep, fluorazepam. But it has a long, it's long acting, so it leads to symptoms of drowsiness, etc. When you're awake, okay. So D is the right answer, which is short acting. Now, what else? Is, what is A, B, and E? Because these are also important. You need to know them. A, midazolam. It's also a benzodiazepine. Remember, they all end up with like lam, pam, lam, pam. Okay, that's how you can remember that benzodiazepine. A is used um, for small procedures, okay, like surgical procedures. Uh, to decrease anxiety and pain, for example, midazolam, okay. Uh, B, lorazepam, uh, oh, I think I have, oh yeah, lorazepam, it's used for status epilepticus. You probably do not know what that means now, but by the end of neuro, you're going to know what that means, and you're also going to know that this is a treatment. Status epilepticus basically means you're having recurrent seizures that's not stopping for a certain period of time. The first uh, line treatment there is lorazepam, okay. C, fluorazepam, like I told you, sleep, but it causes long-term. And then baclofen, what is that? It's used for muscle spasticity. It's also uh, acts at GABA, but it's used in like multiple sclerosis and other like muscle spasticity uh, diseases, okay, like cerebral palsy, etc. So yeah, so let's move on. So like, yeah, like I said here, triazolam, short acting, okay. Uh, by the way, the, I think the better uh, drug to use these days is zolpidem. Okay, so let's say if uh, if you had the same question and instead of triazolam, it was uh, zolpidem. Okay, you would you would you would choose zolpidem. Okay, that's the preferred uh, drug to use. Okay, so another question. Four. Okay, I don't know why these are numbers, but yeah, it's four. Okay, so the answer is flumazenil. So let's read the question. Okay, administration of which of the following drugs is most likely to reverse this patient's symptoms? So I guess they're saying that, oh, the patient has uh, uh, overdose on something. So what's the treatment? So let's read the question. 53-year-old woman, difficulty walking, slurred speech, and progressive drowsiness. Okay. She has a history of insomnia and social anxiety disorder. What are they trying to say here? Why would they tell you that she has a history of insomnia and social anxiety disorder? What did I just tell you before this slide, the question before this? 
is that lo that the uh, benzodiazepines can be used for insomnia, right? So she might be taking benzodiazepines. She might have overdosed. You know, she might. She appears lethargic. Her temperature is thirty six. Pulse normal. Respirations twelve on the lower side. Blood pressure normal. Neurological examination shows normal pupils, hypotonia, and decreased deep tendon reflex. So let's look at the signs and symptoms. Okay. Difficulty walking, slurred speech, and progressive drowsiness. Okay, that's all symptoms uh, of uh, and signs of like decreased CNS activity. You're having some CNS depression. Okay, uh, also being lethargic, hypotonia, and decreased deep tendon reflexes. Reflexes. These are all symptoms, signs, and symptoms of benzodiazepine or GABA uh, against uh, overdose. Okay, a very very important thing to know here is when they mention normal pupils. Why did they mention that? Okay, even in two years, you're gonna see the same question. Okay, you're gonna have to understand this concept even when you're in fourth year. Normal pupils, they're trying to make you sway away from opioid overdose. They're trying to tell you it's probably not opioid overdose. Because if you remember an opioid overdose, they have meiosis, small pupils, okay? And also respirations also decreases with benzodiazepine overdose, but usually more with uh, opioid overdose. So what's the, uh, let's look at the choices. Naloxone, that's for opioid overdose. So that's wrong. Dantrolene, does anyone know what dantrolene is? That's the treatment for malignant hyperthermia, which if you remember, I said you get from inhaled anesthetics or exactly yes, or uh, succinylcholine, okay? Diazepam, you're just gonna be making it worse. Flumazenil, that is the correct answer, okay? Uh, Flumazenil, it's an uh, antagonist IV administration. This came as a past paper question as well. So please remember this, okay, as the answer. Flumazenil is the benzodiazepine antidote, okay? So I left migraine treatment to the end because I think this is probably the easiest question, uh, the easiest, sorry, uh, lecture. So does anyone have any questions about uh, sedative hypnotics? I didn't mention bar uh, barbiturates much, much, but I think it's also because in the lecture, it's not really mentioned much. But just remember, I don't know if this is the first time you take this doctor, uh, Dr. Dana, just remember uh, her transcriptions. Usually when she's emphasizing something, it means probably gonna come. And then her color codes, okay? Whether it's green or red, those are usually the questions usually come from there, whatever is color coded, okay? So let's move on. Sorry, I, I didn't understand your question. Uh, sorry, if you could please repeat it. Okay, I'll come back to your question. So we'll, re we'll let us start off with migraine, okay? So you can read this question. Okay, so people are saying D, that is the correct answer. Let's look at the question, okay. Uh, recurrent headaches, headaches are unilateral, throbbing, and usually preceded by blurring of vision. What's blurring of vision here? What are they trying to tell you? They're trying to tell you there's aura, okay. I think you have a headache lecture, so you probably understand this. They're trying to tell you there's aura, which usually doesn't come with tension headaches, which we've all had, okay. It usually comes with uh, migraine headaches. Symptoms last between 12 and eight hours and relieved by in a dark room. Dark room is also migraine headache. You're trying to point at it more, okay? Uh, the patient prescribed an abortive therapy. So remember, in migraine, we have abortive and we have uh, prophylactic therapy. Abortive is when it's happening, when you're having the migraine, what do you take? Uh, prophylactic is like after that throughout your, your general daily life, okay? You really need to know the difference between uh, which drugs, the, 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 the different drugs for each class, the two classes, okay? It's going to come also later. This is actually high yield to know the, the two different classes, okay? Let's start off with propranolol. It's a beta blocker that is not used for abortive. That's the first line treatment used for prophylactic therapy, okay? 
Uh, gabapentin, it's also prophylactic. Fluoxetine, it's an S uh, SSRI. You're going to learn more about that. It's also used for uh, prophylaxis. And also E, amitriptyline, it's also a uh, anti, it's a depressant. It's also used prophylactically. You have to know all these drugs, all these drugs and when they're used and how they're used, okay? So sumatriptan, triptan, okay? And what is the method of action of triptans? Okay, it's it's through uh, basic constriction of the blood vessels. It's uh, by acting on the serotonin receptors. So serotonin receptor agonist leading to vasoconstriction of the blood vessels, okay? Because that, that's the, the theory behind how migraines occur, that you have vasodilation, also release of uh, mast cell metabolites that can cause inflammation. CGRP also can cause inflammation. That's not good. What is good is serotonin, okay? Uh, so that's sumatriptan for you. So yeah, so like I said, just remember these drugs, okay? You can, an abortive, you can also use uh, NSAIDs and paracetamol, your typical pain relieving medications. And then you also have your ergot, ergot der derivatives, okay? Uh, and like I said, constriction of the cranial, no prophylactic value, remember that. And I think, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but sometimes when, when the doctors really want to go very low yield, look at this, they can ask you specifically what type of serotonin receptor. Maybe try to remember if it's B or D if you have the time. I hope they don't ask that, but like if they input in case they put like A or C or whatever other receptors exist, okay? We have our next question. Uh, so this is the exact same question, guys. I just changed the last two sentences. The patient is prescribed prophylactic therapy, okay? So I think, I mean, I already explained it to you. Uh, I said C, C propranolol is pro prophylactic. But here, let me tell you something, okay? Uh, we got a question two years ago in our exam where it said, which of the following cannot be given to an asthmatic, uh, uh, asthmatic patient for prophylaxis, okay? And that the answer was propranolol. Why? Because propranolol blocks beta-2 receptors, leading to vasoconstriction of the bronchial smooth muscles in the lungs, which can worsen asthma. You probably didn't understand what I just said, because we usually learn this more in the CVV block, but you did kind of touch this in POD, okay? But you have to know that propranolol worsens asthma. It's not good for asthma patients. Asthma only, okay? Not smoking, asthma patients. So if you get that and another choice in an asthmatic patient, you'd give it, you'd, you wouldn't give propranolol, okay? Uh, okay, and the, this is a different question. You can read it. Oh, this is uh, kind of hard. So, yeah. C. Someone said C. Okay. And uh, I think that's the right answer. I think I forgot. Yeah, that is the right answer. Okay. Uh, C. Yeah. So the only thing here is that, okay, she does have migraine headaches. You want an abortive therapy. But the difference here in the question is that they tell you she has depression and takes MAO inhibitors. Now, for you, just for your information, these days, I don't know when much people that take MAO inhibitors. It's really like down in the list of antidepressants usually so with SSRIs. You have many different types of medications, but for per, uh, question purpose, okay? MAO inhibitors has con its uh, interactions with uh, triptans, triptans and ergotamines, okay? Except for one drug, and that drug the doctor wants you to know is narotriptan. Narotriptan, you can give it if the patient's taking MAO inhibitors, cimetidine, propanol, doesn't matter. I think maybe you should memorize this, this table Okay, because it's a good way for doctors to ask you, you know, cheeky questions. And, uh, okay. Oh, wait. Okay, so I think uh, I think we have one more question. Yeah, okay. So this is, let's read this question.
Okay, so let's start with the question. I think it's a hard question. Uh, let's read the last. Which of the following sinus drug effects most likely resulted in this patient's improvement? Uh, so an oral medication prescribed that reduces the extremity stiffness. So they're saying the patient has stiffness and uh, medication reduced extremity stiffness, okay? So she has cerebral palsy. You, you, don't, you probably don't know what that is, but let's say stiffness. So we talked about it this today. What can you give to reduce stiffness? Do you guys remember? I, I mentioned it a few slides ago. I hope someone remembers. I'll give a hint. It was part of the... Uh, sedative hypnotics uh, lecture. Yeah. Wait, what? I think even B. I think even B. I think you, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So the answer is uh, B, okay? Because remember I told you that uh, one of the drugs from the benzodiazepines is baclofen and it reduces stiffness. So this is the this is the explanation, okay? GABA can be used to improve spasticity. Specifically, if you read the second bullet point here, um, it is GABA B is agonized by baclofen, which can also be used to treat uh, spasticity. So that's uh, so that's you can also use baclofen. This is kind of a more detailed question. I don't know if they'll ask you this, but it's good to know, okay? Uh, so yeah, so I'm done with my questions. That's all the questions I have. I think we're almost done with our time too. Uh, does anyone have any questions on any of the four topics we learned today? Otherwise I can just give you some, some of my own tips and advice that hopefully you can use if no one has any questions. By the way, when is, when is your exam? Sunday, oh, okay. So uh, so one thing is for Dr. Hatouf, Hatouf's lecture, uh, she kind of likes low yield stuff from what I remember. She kind of likes the pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics part, part. Okay, like an understanding like the drug, drug distribution, lipophilicity, hydrofolic, stuff like that, okay. Uh, that's, that's what I remember. And then the, uh, everything else I mentioned in the lecture, and I even covered many of the past paper questions that came in the past. Now, so, uh, advice, someone's asking for advice. Okay, uh, advice. Okay, so you, you, the advice I'm about to give you, you probably probably won't help you much for the, for the lecture, for the exam you're gonna have on Sunday, midterm, because it's very early. But for the final, uh, especially uh, if you wanna do residency in USA, I know you're, all, you're only in second year and it's so early to even be thinking about it. It is, okay. But let me just tell you something. You started learning uh, the pathology part of things, okay? Before it was just anatomy, physiology, histology. Now you're doing pathology, pharmacology, and you're getting into the real stuff, which, which is going to be the bulk of third year and also the board exams, whichever board exam you do internationally or locally, okay? Specifically, if you want to go to America, I would highly, 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 I would very highly recommend you after your midterm use U world for your final because everything in U world now in the neuro block okay it's i don't know how many questions maybe 400 questions in neuro it covers everything you've taken so if you start doing U world from now okay if you start doing U world in, in neuro head and neck and then third year okay not only are you almost guaranteed if you do new if you do U world the lectures okay and uh, and past papers and also, if you can add on to it, boards and beyond and pathoma, you're almost guaranteed an A minus. I can feel like you're guaranteed an A minus. And then just a few extra steps in the lectures for that low yield stuff to get an A, to get an A okay? But not just that, if you do use boards and beyond, pathoma, and then U world, these three resources throughout your studying for your blocks, okay? And especially in third year, every, in every block, I can guarantee you, 100% guarantee, I'm giving you 100%, okay, let's say 99% that your um, USMLE exam, step one, will be so easy. It will be very easy. It will be really, really easy. Why? I know I know this is very early. I don't want to stress you. You can just come back to this advice after the midterm, okay? But uh, because not many people know that, but your world is the main thing you're going to be using for step one. So if you start using it from now, not only is it helping you in your blocks, in your GPA, but it's also going to help you a lot for step one and step two. It will make it super easy. 
So that's the biggest advice I can give you. And the second thing is that, in my opinion, like medicine isn't, uh, it's just a lot. Okay, the concepts aren't very, very hard. It's just a lot, a lot of lectures, a lot of concepts. So the biggest way to deal with a lot is just start early. Okay, you have to start early. You can't cram things. When I started studying early, like even just study, even if you study a little per day, okay? Don't leave everything to the weekend. Study on weekdays. Life's going to become much easier for you, especially in the end. You're going to get better grades and you're going to be less anxious, less depressed uh, by cramming stuff, okay? It's going to become a lot easier if you start studying from early, even just like an hour, an hour and a half, two hours a day at home. It'll be a lot of help, okay? So that's the advice I have in my head. If you if you wanna if you want more like help on these lectures, the four lectures I gave you, or any other advice uh, in any way medically or not, you can take you can uh, send me an email. It's on the first slide of the uh, the lecture. So that's it for uh, for this. Doctor Imad, uh, Doctor Imad, uh, Dawi, right? I think that's his name. Uh, I think he had pretty straightforward questions. He had uh, he would heavily emphasize no no I, I don't know there's two dr imads there's another dr imad right cns tumors we had a different doctor guys is uh what's his last name i have to know his last name to remember who he is the r last name okay yeah uh we didn't have cns tumors with him we had a different doctor but his uh questions were usually straightforward he emphasizes a lot on the important things in his lecture he emphasizes it like five times He'll tell you this slide is extremely, extremely important, and that comes, okay? So just look at his transcription. If there's no transcription, I mean, if you go through the uh, the video, it's probably gonna take a bit more long, a bit longer, but yeah, like I said, he usually emphasizes a lot, uh, and his slides are usually enough. Any advice for brainstem? Repetition. Brainstem is gonna be like, uh, when you're studying brainstem maybe in two years or like for your final brainstem is going to be so easy like really like because why because of repetition like i know everyone that's starting second year before neuro everyone has this idea damn brainstem is going to be so hard it's going to be so hard when you're done with it when you're done with neuro people realize hey brainstem wasn't that hard you want to know why they, they realize it wasn't that hard because they repeated it so many times you just have to repeat 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 also for brainstem use ninja nerd ninja nerd helped me I don't know if it'll help you, but Ninja Nerd helped me. Also, the rules of four, the rule of four, I think that's also for brainstem. Uh, use boards and beyond. Okay, use these resources. They're very good. But Ninja Nerd helped me a lot for, for not only brainstem, the whole CNS block, the whole neuro block, uh, Ninja Nerd helped a lot. So have you heard of him? If you haven't heard of him, maybe you can Google him, check his YouTube videos, okay? So I think we can stop the recording there. Thank you very much for participating. And if you're watching on YouTube, 